Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Whatever time it is, wherever you are tuning in, thank you for joining me today for the Brahma Vihara's loving kindness for groups. Uh, now, this, is, this episode is mostly just a talk. I'm going to be addressing a few questions that I received uh, and giving an introduction to this next stage of the practice. And I'll kind of jump back and forth between those two because a lot of the questions that I received can be addressed in the introduction itself. How convenient. <laughs> so, uh, but the first question I want to uh, respond to was a question about the loving kindness phrases themselves. Where do they come from? And the phrases that I'm using, I'll just uh, go through them very quickly here. Uh, may I be happy? Uh, may I be healthy, or may we, whatever, whichever pronoun you're using that fits the stage of the practice. Uh, may we live a life of peace without struggle. May we open to things just as they are. May we experience the world opening to us just as we are. May we welcome whatever arises, like that. So those are the phrases that are being referred to in this question. Uh, now, the phrases that I'm using here, they're slightly different than the traditional orthodox uh, meta phrases. There's a little bit of variation on those. Uh, these were given to me by my teacher uh, s several years ago, many, many years ago, 2004, I guess. <laughs> and so, um, and I found these phrases to be uh, very um, provocative in a way, very ev evocative, I guess the word is. It ev they evoke a lot more feeling than the typical, I think the phrases typically are, uh, may I be happy, uh, may I be healthy, may I live with ease, uh, may I be safe, or something like that. So they're very pithy, short phrases. These have a little more granularity to them. Uh, they, they dig a little bit deeper and so that's why I've decided to use these phrases. Um, uh, yes, so that's where these phrases come from. That's why they are just a slight different differentiation from the traditional uh, meta phrases. Like that. So loving kindness for groups of people. And this is done in the same way where we take those phrases that I just went through and we uh, send them out uh, to first a person that we love or that we're fond of, then we send them to a stranger, somebody we don't know, a neutral person, and then we send the phrases to somebody we don't like, a perceived enemy. And the, when we send, and we do this all at once, so in the visualization we would bring the phrases to our own heart first, and then we send the phrases out to the three people at the same time. Now, some people I work with one-on-one, -on -one, they like to envision all four of them sitting at a card table or perhaps a dining table, or a, a few of my uh, students work with people. Uh, they use this, uh, they s visualize themselves at a campfire, uh, which I find that's quite nice too. You can kind of visualize yourself sitting around a campfire, there's your loved one, there's the person you don't know in front of you, and the person you don't like very much on the other side there. Now, this can be a challenging practice, and if it doesn't unfold uh, the way you expect it to or the way you would like it to, that's okay. We always move through these ch uh, challenging practices uh, with a healthy dose of self-compassion, moving forward with a feather light touch, so to speak. Uh, and it's not all going to happen in one practice. We're not gonna go through these loving kindness practices once, uh, one day on each, and then come out loving kindness masters. <laughs> uh, so, when I first started loving-kindness practice, 
I did these stages uh, two to three weeks on each stage. So it takes about three months to get through the whole uh, of the loving kindness practice. And that was years and years ago. And then I keep coming back to it over and over again, over and over again. So it's a, it's a very slow and steady burn, so to speak. So uh, just know that. And, and when you go into the practices, be kind to yourself, uh, be gentle with yourself. If at any time the practice gets too emotional, you get upset or you start clenching down against the practice or too tense, uh, that's the too hot zone, and I've spoken about that before. So if you feel like you're entering into an area that's too hot for you emotionally, uh, the first thing to do there is to take a few breaths, hear the sounds of the present moment, feeling the sensations of the clothing on the skin, the body against the cushion or chair, maybe noticing your feet against the floor, feeling the breath entering and leaving the body, coming back, the present moment and then re-enter back into the practice again sending the loving kindness here to this group of other of three other people and then if challenging emotions come up again you feel like you're getting tense you're forcing the practice that's it you're finished don't don't keep trying to go into the practice don't keep pushing uh, that can be very detrimental to meditation because then it's, at the very least it starts to feel like a chore, it starts to feel like something you don't really want to do, and then we put the practice aside. That's why uh, many people quit meditation. It's because it starts to feel uh, like a chore or like it's something they just don't want to do. Uh, ideally, meditation, any type of meditation, should feel like a joy, like a pleasure to come to. And I can talk more about that later. Um, so we want to keep the meditation uh, in a way uh, challenging enough to grow from, challenging enough to receive benefit, but not so challenging that we just don't want to do it like that. That's quite important. So some of the things to be aware of in this stage of uh, loving kindness for this group is that here we have the archetypes. We have the archetypal person we're fond of, this person we care for, the person we don't know, so there's no attraction or aversion towards that person, and then the person we don't like. And those are representative of the three major types of relationships we have with people throughout our life. So when we go into this practice, we're offering these beautiful, precious gifts of loving kindness to these three types of relationships, these three people. Uh, we first start to become aware of how we're preferring. I prefer to give loving kindness to the loved one. I don't really want to give loving kindness to, to my enemy and uh, this person I'm indifferent to. They could get it. They maybe they don't. It doesn't really matter to me. And so we start to notice this type of dance uh, that we do, this type of uh, attraction and aversion dance that we uh, embark on as we move through our life. And what becomes really pronounced is how exhausting that is. And so once one starts to notice that, uh, a certain type of equanimity starts to uh, be born into the practice, because we don't really need to do that. Now, I also want to reiterate what I said yesterday and the day before, particularly about the enemy here, the perceived enemy. Uh, if we feel that that person has really transgressed against us, uh, we don't want to use these or any meditation practices to condone bad behavior. But what these practices actually allow us to do is that if somebody has transgressed against us, we are allowed to let go of the resentment and address that situation free from emotional reactivity. We can address that bad behavior without yelling, pick, kicking, punching, screaming, shouting. We can just say, tell that person uh, what you did here. I didn't appreciate that. 
We also don't ever really need to talk to that person again or associate with that person or they don't need to be welcomed into our life. But we can at least move forward from that place. And so these practices of loving kindness are really um, great at allowing us to release that stone of resentment and move forward into the present moment uh, and address that situation like that without the emotional reactivity. That's one of the great, great benefits of loving kindness practice. So we start to notice this lightness and darkness in this practice because we have the loved one here and we have the perceived enemy there on the other side. And in between them, we have the neutral person. So we have this kind of uh, yin and yang, uh, light and dark uh, polarity happening within the meditation practice itself. Uh, that is something to really take note of in this practice. Notice how that feels. There's nothing right or wrong about it, but when it starts to appear, just recognize it, just feel it. Uh, that's another one of the great benefits of this practice is to recognize uh, the polarities of light and dark, high and low, hot and cold, good and bad. Uh, we can start to really feel that in a very profound way here. So, Oftentimes in these practices, uh, doubt arises. Uh, often we get these thoughts, oh, this person, for example, the phrase, may we all be happy. All right, if we're working with a group, we might use the, that form, may we all, may we all be happy. But let's say the person, your perceived enemy, uh, you perceive them as being a very unhappy person. So it's quite likely through that perception that in your mind you'll, you will see them as not being able to receive that gift that you're sending them. Your mind will say, oh, that's impossible. They'll never be happy. That, that will never happen for them. That type of doubt is a resistance to the loving kindness. It, it arises as a way of blockage like that. Any kind of thought like that, which allows, that doesn't allow, rather, the loving kindness to flow from your heart to that person's heart is a resistance. So something you can do there is you can ask yourself, what am I resisting right now? Is resistance necessary in this practice right now? You don't even need to answer those questions, but just allow the question to guide your awareness. That's a way of allowing the practice to dig a little bit deeper. Now, loving kindness practice, we're not really trying to change anything or alter anything. We're just noticing how we either resist to loving kindness, we shut down to loving kindness, or how we open to loving kindness. And so the more you do that type of practice and, and then you drop those little inquiries in, what am I resisting right now? What you might start to notice is that it actually feels good. Uh, it feels equally good to send loving kindness to a loved one as it does to a stranger, as it does to a perceived enemy. It feels good for us, for our own heart. And some people actually have the opposite resistance, where they can extend loving kindness to a perceived enemy and to a neutral person, but then they have trouble extending loving kindness to a loved one. And that's fine too. It's just a way of showing us how we resist our experiences of loving kindness. Like that. There's nothing wrong with any of that. Uh, it's just uh, this practice is showing us again where our boundaries are. And in that revealing of our boundaries, uh, we start to relax those boundaries. And eventually, loving kindness begins to flow uh, from our heart to all different types of people. We start to recognize that because all beings want happiness and want to avoid suffering, we're all 
eligible to receive loving kindness. It's our birthright as human beings. Now, I understand that many people hearing this, listening to this, might have the idea that, well, yes, we all want happiness and want to avoid suffering, but why is that person creating so much suffering for the world, or for their family, or for their people? And sadly, that, that does happen. And it's because as we grow as beings, as we encounter certain experiences in life, uh, that urge towards happiness and away from suffering becomes distorted sometimes. And sometimes it gets horribly distorted. Uh, examples like Hitler and things like that, where, where people are so distorted in their view uh, that they cause great suffering and harm. But when we peel all of that away, all of that distortion away, we actually can see that they too, at the heart of the matter, they want to avoid suffering and want happiness. And so recognizing that we actually have the seeds in our heart for all human behavior. And if, if I was born under, let's use Hitler as an example again, if I was born under Hitler's parents and had the upbringing that Adolf Hitler had and had the same life experiences that Adolf Hitler had and had the same education that Adolf Hitler had, I would have done the same things that Adolf Hitler did. Now that's a really <laughs> challenging example, <laughs> but it makes it, it makes it really obvious how, how difficult uh, that can be sometimes. And also how compassionate we can be when we recognize that we are the same in that way, that I would be behaving the same way all of you would be behaving in your life if I had had your parents, if I had had your education, if I was born into your culture, if I was born uh, under your parents, if I had your siblings, if I had listened to the same music you listened to, if I had had your opportunities, I would be behaving in exactly the same way you all would. You would be behaving in the same way I do if you had my education and so forth. So all of the seeds of all human behavior are inherent in each one of our hearts. And it's only because of certain experiences that we encounter in life that certain behavior seeds get watered and others don't. And so when we really boil it down like that, we can really then, hopefully, uh, move forward with compassion for all beings. Move forward uh, with loving kindness for the perceived enemy, for the person we don't know, and for the person we love equally. And again, these practices aren't easy, although they are quite accessible. Uh, they're easy to understand, uh, but they're not easy uh, to engage very deeply with. Uh, so again, I, I always encourage people to move forward uh, with loving-kindness practices with a feather-light touch, a healthy dose of self-compassion. The best way to practice these practices is to start uh, with the first practice, loving-kindness for the self. And you do that practice just for yourself for two weeks, two to three weeks. Just sending loving kindness for yourself. A half an hour a day, perfect. If you can do more, that's great. If you can, if you can only do 10 minutes a day, that's also beneficial. Um, but a half an hour a day of loving kindness for the self, perfect. Uh, and if you need more guidance on that stage of the practice, uh, I did one of those guided meditations about a week ago. 
uh, so you can revisit that. It's all up on my YouTube channel, and they'll be up on my website shortly as well. So you do that stage weeks. You go to loving kindness for the loved one for two weeks, uh, loving kindness for the stranger for two weeks. Now that's six weeks of practice right there. Loving kindness to the perceived enemy for another two weeks. That's eight weeks of practice. So after eight weeks of practice, there's quite a lot of momentum moving into the practice. You'll be really experiencing uh, some great benefit at that point. You'll ha your heart will have opened in a certain way. Uh, there'll be a warmth in your relationships with others, even the people you don't know, even the people you don't like. And when we start to feel that, we start to recognize, wow, this practice is really working. So then when we enter into the stage of loving kindness for others, where we're holding in our mind's eye or in our awareness, a loved one, a stranger, and somebody we don't like, those all together, uh, we have the confidence to move into the practice uh, uh, knowing that the, the benefits are coming. So that, that is quite important. It's one of the reasons why I really encourage people to spend time on each stage of the practice. Now, all of that being said, I will guide a full guided meditation on this stage tomorrow. Uh, so even if you haven't spent two weeks on each stage and you're just joining me now or you're just coming in tomorrow, you will still receive benefit from sp spending time uh, sending loving kindness to these three archetypal people, uh, the, the, the loved one, the stranger, and the person we don't like. Uh, there's still benefit in doing that. Uh, it's not that there's not going to be any benefit, but the real way to embrace loving kindness is to really spend enough time in each stage so that you can really allow the phrases to touch your heart and you feel the, how the relationship between yourself and the person you don't like, for example, how that relationship starts to change, how it starts to evolve, just by sending this person over and over again uh, these gifts of loving kindness, these beautiful phrases of loving kindness. Our heart starts to soften. We start to see people we don't like in a different light. Not only that one person, uh, but we start to see uh, people who we encounter in our life, if they, they give us tension, or we have this troubled relationship with them, our heart softens to that. It starts to shift. We start to see that even this person, although they give us great trouble in our life, they too want to avoid suffering and want happiness. Uh, and so, so that's one, another one of the real beautiful benefits of loving kindness practice. So in this stage of the practice, we come to the breath, the body, the sounds. Uh, then we, in a visualization, see three people in front of us. We see the person we love, the person we don't like. I'm sorry, the person we love, the stranger in the middle the person we don't like on the other side. And I like seated around a campfire. That's quite nice because it's kind of an informal setting if you visualize something like that. Now, if visualization is difficult for you, that's not a problem. Just saying these people's name or trying to get a feel for what their presence might be like in your company. And then we just bring up the phrases of loving kindness. May we all be happy. We can visualize all four of us, including our own heart, receiving the phrase and visualizing what our life would look and feel like if these phrases were completely reflective of our life circumstance. Again, paying close attention to the polarity, the person you love, the person you don't like, the tension there how that might feel, sending them both loving kindness at the same time. The neutral person, knowing that they are too are just like everyone else in the world, human, 
they too deserve happiness and deserve to live a life free from suffering. And then our own heart, recognizing that we too deserve love and compassion and deserve to live a life free from suffering. That's very, very important as well and not to be overlooked. And so I received the question, uh, what do I do if discomfort arises in the body, in the mind, in the heart during a loving kindness practice? Your foot falls asleep, your shoulder starts to ache, maybe you're itching in the nose. That's very common. Huh? Uh, so anytime discomfort arises in the body, in the mind, in the heart, let's use the example of, of something physical, like uh, the foot falling asleep. That's also very common in meditation, particularly if you're sitting on a meditation cushion. But even if you're sitting in a chair, if you've you know, sat still for a half an hour, your limbs could start to fall asleep. So if that happens in meditation, normally what we want to do is to try to move the body, to adjust the body, to alleviate that, that gnawing, tingling sensation, right? We want to be, become more comfortable. Now, there are some teachers that recommend that you just sit through that and you grin and bear it. I, I don't really subscribe to that point of view. I, there is some benefit to that, I suppose. Uh, but what I recommend is that before you move your body, before you scratch the itch, before you move the leg to alleviate the falling sleep sensation in the foot, Ask yourself, can I rest with this? Now, when you ask that type of question, can I rest with this itch? Can I rest with this pain? Before you move to alleviate the itch, to relieve yourself from the pain, what you've done there is you've brought mindfulness to the decision of moving away from discomfort and grasping at comfort. That's quite powerful. This, is, can be, this can be one of the great learning experiences of meditation, one of the great tools that we can cultivate in a meditation practice is this mindfulness of pushing away discomfort and grasping at comfort. Because we're, we're doing that all the time. It's habitual, it's part of the human uh, DNA, is that we, we push away discomfort and grasp at comfort all the time. Now, that's not a problem. The problem is, is that that habit, uh, when it's done over and over again, as all habits are, when it's unconscious like that, uh, it leads to imbalance, it leads to addiction. We push away discomfort and we grasp at the material, the substance, whatever we grasp at, that we've uh, given power over our comfort, over our well-being. So we push away the uncomfortable situation and we grasp at the whatever it is that's going to give us comfort. And if we, if we don't make that habit conscious, if we don't bring mindfulness to that, uh, we can cause a lot of suffering for ourselves and for others. And we see this all the time in our everyday experience. We, we can witness that in other people and we can witness it in ourselves. So in meditation, if, if again, the example of the foot falling asleep in practice, okay, you're feeling it in meditation. Oh, that's really achy. Wow, I really should move that. And your mind is all, can I rest with this? The answer might be yes, actually. Oh, it's not so bad. I can rest with this. There's only a few minutes left in the meditation, hopefully, and then it'll be over. Not a problem. Continue with the practice. Continue resting into the meditation. Beautiful. The answer might be no. I can't rest with this. It's really gnawing. My mind is just going to obsess about it for the rest of the meditation. It'll ruin my practice. Then, if the answer is no, move the leg. Adjust the leg feel better, get comfortable, that's fine. Then you can actually even experience what that feels like, moving from discomfort into comfort. Ah, 
Oh, that feels really good. My leg feels better now. Okay, back to the meditation practice. Again, the point is, is that now we've brought mindfulness to that decision. And the more we can do this in a meditation practice, the more it starts to bleed over in everyday life. We start to recognize, oh, I'm going to get that cigarette because I'm not comfortable with what the present moment is bringing me. Or I'm going to eat that bag of potato chips because I'm bored and I'm not comfortable in my boredom. Or I'm going to, you know, whatever it is, whatever we're reaching for, to, to take the edge off of that present moment experience because it doesn't feel quite right. It doesn't feel comfortable. We start to notice how we do that. And then you can even use that question in everyday life. Can I rest with this boredom? Can I rest with this hunger? Can I rest with this urge to take a bath? Whatever it is. Whatever it is when we feel something is not right and we want to move away from it and we feel moving towards something unconsciously, take a breath. Can I rest with this? And I think more often than not, people find, well, yeah, I can rest with this. It's not bad. The answer might be, no, I can't rest with this. And you know what? I am going to get that bag of potato chips. <laughs> and that's fine. But now we've brought mindfulness to that decision so that you keep doing that, you start to circumvent the decisions that will cause suffering to yourself and cause suffering to others. Very, very powerful. So I think that's all I want to say today. Thank you all for joining me. I'll be back tomorrow at the same time to guide a full meditation practice on loving kindness uh, for this group. And I'll be using the group that I described. I'll be using uh, a loved one, a stranger, and a perceived enemy. And then tomorrow I'll talk about how to use different types of groups, how to send it to other people as well. If you want to, you know, maybe there's a group of uh, uh, migrant workers in Singapore that you want to send loving kindness to. Beautiful. You can do that. And there are other groups. Uh, if you feel that uh, this certain group is downtrodden and you want to extend loving kindness to that group, that, that is a whole nother separate practice. Uh, and that is another practice that is also uh, quite beautiful and lovely and enjoyable <laughs> and challenging and all the rest of it. So thank you again. Uh, this is my humble offering to try to raise uh, the vibrations of the world currently, my humble offering uh, to try to bring some levity and light. I hope you found it at least entertaining, if not beneficial. I will be back again tomorrow for more of the same. Uh, tomorrow will be again a guided meditation and less talking, and you can thank me or curse me for that later. <laughs> uh, stay safe, stay clean, stay healthy, uh, wash your hands, wear your masks, practice your social distancing, and we'll get through all of this together. Thank you.